First, I want to explain that the American Field Service is an independent organization, complete in itself. Our role in the war is to supplement the medical transport service of the armies with which we serve. We work side by side with the soldiers of our allies, but we are not actually soldiers. We're really civilian volunteers serving without pay. We carry wounded from the front lines back to the mobile dressing stations and the field hospitals. We don't fight. Our job is to save lives and to release other men for fighting by taking their places. Our record is an honorable one. In the 1914 war, we brought back over half a million wounded from the under fire. In 1940, we served in the amiens Bove sector until France fell. We had our share in the Syrian campaign. And a month before the attack on Pearl Harbor, we had already sailed to join the British and free French forces in the Middle East. And we've continued to serve there in ever increasing numbers. And now, General Wavell has asked us to work with the British Army in India. We will need more men and more ambulances for that theater of war and for replacements in the Middle East. That is the one purpose of this film, to get volunteers. The other is to express our appreciation for the generous support already given us by so many individuals and communities throughout this country. The story, while necessarily incomplete, is nevertheless an authentic picture of the part American Field Service drivers have played in Montgomery's great victory over Rommel. The picture is called Letter from Libya. Joan, darling, here at last is that long, threatened letter. I've been pretty slow about it, but what's the use of making excuses? I'm writing this off in the middle of the Libyan desert, sitting on the tail end of my ambulance, surrounded by sand, silence, and flies. The sand and flies are eternal, not the silence. I only hope it'll last long enough to finish this. The morning after I left you, I got to New York just in time to join my unit at headquarters and get in on the final instructions from the leader of our contingent. Pretty lucky. I'd anticipated a long wait before sailing. The fellows are a grand lot. They'd come from all over. Omaha, Seattle, Boston, Houston, Memphis, Kalamazoo, every corner of the USA. Many of them, like me, had enlisted from college. There was a certain amount of last minute packing. Had to be sure the extra soap and razor blades were really there. And enough cigarettes. Bedding rolls had to be made ship-shape. Finally, the last strap was fastened. We shouldered our kits and were off to the boat. The censor is not fond of ship convoy gossip, so we'll skip it including my seasickness. The main thing is that we got to our Egyptian port safely and darn happy to be there. There's nothing like good solid ground after all. British trucks were waiting for us. We loaded our duffel aboard and were taken off to a huge transit and training camp called Mob Center, or if you want to be formal, Mobilization Center. Our ambulances were there. Shipped over long before we sailed. Dodge trucks, four-wheel drive. A swell job, they'll go anywhere. Nothing on tires can beat them over a bad ground, except perhaps the Jeeps. We were issued tin hats and gas masks, taught map reading, the use of a compass, and other things essential to warfare on this neck of the woods. 
and when considered fairly desert worthy, we were reviewed by our officers and a British brigadier. Rather a bore, but soon over. The next day we were off in convoy to the western desert. Everything went okay until the car ahead of me got stuck in the sand. Something that seldom happens to these four-wheel drive cars, but it happened this time. I drew up ahead of him. We rigged up a chain for a short tow. I don't like chains, a rope's better, I think. And the chain busted. But we'd got up enough momentum to pull out, and we're on our way again. A darn long way at that. Was I hungry? I almost ate my tin hat before we got to the new camp. And what do you think the first thing we saw was on arrival? Food. The British cooks had gone on ahead. We filled our mess tins and sat on the sand to eat. Or used the fender of an ambulance as a lunch counter. Bully beef, it's corn beef to you, was never my idea of a feast. But I don't remember a meal that tasted better than that one. Even with a few flies mixed up in it. After that we got down to car maintenance. Sand gets into everything. Engines have to be checked continually. Back home, greasing shackles is something the service station does for you. Here you do it yourself, and often. Also, you climb on top of your car and dust off the Red Cross. Each man dug himself a slit trench, nice and handy to dive into in case of an air raid. You get used to the lack of civilized conveniences, but not to the monotony of waiting for action. But you can liven that now and then with a bottle of beer from the Mobile Canteen, or maybe a game of cards on the sand beside your ambulance. Cars aren't the only thing that need maintenance. Mothers can be sure they're missed when buttons come off. And the flies don't help the situation. Blast them, they certainly seem to dominate existence here. The literary-minded went in for a spot of appropriate desert reading. And even scraping the bristles off the old pan was a time killer. We all got pretty restless and jumpy until one morning I awakened to the news that the forward movement had just begun before daybreak and we were to follow with the rest of the brigade. That meant spreading camouflage nets over the Red Crosses. An ambulance convoy going to the front has one definite message for enemy scout planes. It means final preparations for attack. Our officers showed the direction on the map. We checked up on the route ourselves. Final dispatches were interchanged between us and medical headquarters. I watched a South African officer put the spare petrol tins on his car. Petrol tins, gasoline cans and the convoy was off. Oh, it was great. Trucks, tanks, and everything swarming away. There was a feeling of excitement in the air. You could see it in the faces of the men. I could hardly wait until the advance lot got underway and we could join in. My ambulance was just behind the staff car, but I could barely see it at times on account of the dust. We got to our new position, dispersed our cars far apart against air attack, and then lay doggo under a full moon. All about us was silence, that tense silence of breathless waiting, until... Zero hour, then hell broke loose!
experience of battle, terrific, and darn frightening if you want the truth. Then the worst part started, the casualties. Hastily treated on the spot, rifles used as splints, anything, until help came. Our time of waiting was over. Our real job began. I'll never forget that first call to the dressing station, climbing in the car and starting off. Our ambulance drew up in front of the tent, in which the British surgeons were just beginning the heartbreaking work that was to keep them busy night and day for a long time to come. British bearers brought a patient out, a New Zealand soldier, unconscious, doped with morphine to ease the pain, his head almost completely covered with a blood-stained bandage, one leg at a Thomas splint. He was put aboard the ambulance with great care. Then taken to the next field hospital for more thorough treatment. Our ambulances were sent back and forth between dressing stations. Now we knew what we were here for, loading these poor devils, carrying, unloading, taking them to expert care in the hope of recovery. The wounded poured in, all kinds, Cockneys, Yorkshiremen, South Africans, Indians, New Zealanders, Australians, the great fighting French, World's ends united in one supreme task. There were never enough ambulances. There never are in battle. The medical staffs were untiring. They're all members of the British Army Medical Corps. Surgeons, attendants, orderlies, stretcher bearers. Though sometimes South African blacks are used as bearers. Along with each wounded man, a record slip was sent, giving his name, the nature of his injuries, the treatment already given, so that the surgeons at the next stop could carry on with no waste of precious time. There's never enough time. There are always men lying, waiting for treatment. We're not medical experts, but we do give first aid at times, tourniquets, simple bandages, sometimes splints. I suppose we've saved a lot of lives that way. Churchill gave us the formula for victory, blood, sweat, and tears. I can sweat two-thirds of it. We've seen lots of blood here and lots of sweat, but I haven't seen any tears, not from the wounded. Their stoicism is unbelievable. When you think a man's about to shriek with pain, he grits his teeth and forces a grin. There may be tears in your eyes, but not in his.
It was all pretty sickening and heartbreaking. Some of the wounded could walk by themselves, but most, so appallingly, most had to be carried. You knew that some cases were fatal, but you felt that many would recover and have another chance at life, perhaps even the chance to fight again. The one cheerful note was the arrival of the mail. I got a letter from you in the midst of the Alamein battle. You can't know how awfully much it meant to me, darling. I was pretty low then. Your letter pulled me together and made me see things straight. See that my job was everything. The job of taking these poor chaps to safety and comfort and expert care. injuries seem the worst of all, especially burns, you can see those, but you don't see the chest and stomach wounds, they're covered by blankets, but they're the most serious, must be gotten to treatment quickly if they're to be saved. I don't know what the percentage of salvage is, but they say it's good. It's great to feel that there are thousands of Montgomery's men alive today thanks to a bunch of volunteer American ambulance drivers. Our work went on to the accompaniment of a constant repetition of air attack, artillery, tank and infantry charges, the rattle of machine guns, the shaking of the earth from bomb explosions, and the wounded, always the wounded, until the Germans began to retreat. Then there were fewer engagements, longer advances, and an easing up in casualties, except when Rommel turned and snarled at us. Our main worry was minefields, there were plenty. we got to Tripoli at last. And believe it or not, my sweet, I was along with the first unit to enter that delectable village. Was that something? And were they glad to see us? After a day or so in Clover, I was sent off to take the place of one of our drivers of the fighting French unit. We ran into a German air attack. Then we got the signal to pick up one of the crew of a battery of 75s who'd been hit by a bomb fragment. We followed directions and got him aboard. I wondered if he'd been one of General Koenig's fighting French who'd made that incredible stand at Vera Kame. I never knew, because he didn't regain conscience in the, in the car. But I have a hunch he was, and I hope that one day he'll be able to do the same sort of thing again for his France. On the way back, we met some Bren gun carriers out on patrol. They'd run into an ambush, and one man had been hit by a machine gun bullet. They gave us the sign, and we went down into a hollow, me in the spare driver's place, standing up with my head through the lookout opening in the roof. One of the Bren carriers brought the wounded man down. He was still conscious with only a slight head wound. was transferred to the ambulance. The Bren carrier got back on its job, and we on ours. Well, that's that up to now. You get the picture? Dull going sometimes, but not while the battle's on.
then there are never enough ambulances or drivers. And now there's a call for more drivers and more cars. They've asked the American Field Service to serve in India. Love, Johnny.